Here's an idea. Avatar The Last Airbender and The Legend of Korra are anime. If you were to check my DVR, you would see four things. Adventure Time, Regular Show, and The Legend of Korra. And How I Met Your Mother, which my girlfriend records and I pretend to hate but secretly think is genius. Shh, don't tell her. Anyway, in 2005, Nickelodeon began airing Avatar The Last Airbender, a story about a world where magic is as common as war and where a great figure, the Avatar, has the singular ability to unite both magical and national forces. Only the Avatar can master all four types of elementally themed magic, called bending. There's only one Avatar at a time, and a new one is born as soon as the old one dies, which is pretty brutal. And means, as a rule, they experience a kind of coming-of-age hero's journey with magic and super cool hybrid animals. Which is exactly what we saw happen with Aang, the avatar from the first series, and Korra, the protagonist of the currently ongoing series, The Legend of Korra, henceforth collectively referred to as the Avatars. What is perhaps most striking about the Avatars at first is their style, both visual and tonal. It's for kids, but also not really. There are serious themes, political messages, complex relationships, including one very controversial love triangle, all packaged up in an animated TV show rated Y7. So, you know, for, for kids. kids. But that doesn't mean that the show complexity suffers at all. For instance, there are four nations and they all have their own attitude, history, and look. Show creator Brian Konietzko has listed plenty of influences on the show's style. Asian cinema, Chinese, Indian, and Korean culture, Harry Potter, Eastern philosophy, and maybe most importantly, anime. Specifically, Cowboy Bebop, Fooly Cooly, Miyazaki, though I did recently learn that the famed director might not necessarily consider his films anime, strictly speaking. The fact that anime is listed amongst those influences makes perfect sense. Many people's first reactions, including my own upon seeing the avatars, is, oh, is this anime? And what they usually mean is, is this animated TV show made in Japan? And in so asking, they're also stubbing their toe on an interesting conundrum. Because as far as the West is concerned, and more on that later, the avatars are definitely not anime. When we say anime, we mean Akira, Evangelion, Samurai Shampoo, Naruto, Trigun, etc. And sure, in a visual comparison, there is a difference between the avatars and these things, though sometimes not a significant one. A point made very handily by Chris O'Brien over at The Escapist a couple years ago. Link in the doobly-doo. But strictly speaking, it's not the subject, tone, or style that makes or breaks animeitude in the West, it's that the avatars aren't made in Japan. Which is especially interesting given that in Japan, the word anime is used to reference any animated work regardless of nationality. So, while the avatars aren't animes here, it stands to reason that they are in Japan, along with The Simpsons and Boondocks and Archer, and you get the point. These things might be foreign anime or Western anime, but anime nonetheless. But the avatars, I think, are a much more interesting case given, all things considered, their resemblance to what many of us would call authentic anime. Meaning, if the avatars were exactly the same but made in Japan, would they unequivocally be called anime in the West? It's that thin line accounting for genre solidity that's really interesting. There's one between champagne and sparkling wine, Tennessee whiskey versus bourbon, pizza versus Papa John's, anime versus cartoon versus animated TV show. For all intents and purposes, these things are the things that they technically are not. Real talk though, I actually love Papa John's. And it's that technically that's really neat. Like, by the anime standards we were just discussing, Torkaiser is not an anime because it was made in the Middle East. But look at it. It's an anime! The question, I think, is then what is gained by excluding works that meet major stylistic criteria from a genre? Are we maintaining the usefulness of the word anime, having it mean a very specific thing? There is a usefulness in having anime communicate a quality or set of qualities, but is a disservice done when it starts excluding things that admirers of the form might otherwise appreciate regardless of its authenticity, which is just, oh, so many quote fingers. So authenticity, so complicated. Or speaking of which, maybe it's about protecting the sanctity or quality of the genre itself. In classic, that's not punk rock fashion, does saying the avatars are not anime somehow maintain an artistic integrity within the genre? Are avatar deniers protecting their own cultural turf from noobs? Or maybe, as animated works continue their path to legitimacy in the West, this will become a non-question. And we will eventually adopt the Japanese usage. Can you imagine? Family Guy, an anime. Adventure Time, anime. Bob's Burgers, anime. What do you guys think? What does the genre designation anime mean? And is it changing? Does Avatar have anything to do with it? Let us know in the comments, and subscribe out of pity because of how bad you feel that I have a cold.
Roll, 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 roll. Ah, ha, 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 ha. Remember, this week we're going to be responding to comments from two videos Surveillance and Reality TV and Trolls. And we're going to do it in that order. Mythic Alex Thanks and Benjamin Chai have pointed out my mispronunciation of Jaif. Thank you. Janet Celine points out that another example of a kind of media which might transgress some privacy boundaries is vlogging. And yeah, I think, you know, the tension between the two, those two things is that in reality TV, it's, it seems to me that it's a lot of like, I can't believe these people are like this. Whereas in vlogging, it's someone welcoming you into their life, I, I guess. But yeah, I wonder, you know, which one um, is a more constructed experience, if that's even a fair thing to ask. June Bendick and Joe Betzel both ask whether or not if you claim that reality TV is changing people's ideas about privacy, do you then also have to agree that violent video games make people violent and other kinds of media affect people in different ways? And I think there's a lot um, to this question. There's questions about uh, the general audience of both of those things, the cultural pervasiveness of all of them. But yeah, this is a really great and I think very complicated question to ask. Bill Bird says that it's not reality TV that affects our ideas about surveillance, but rather our pre-existing ideas about surveillance make reality TV seem normal. And this makes me think about Josh Harris's project that was documented in that movie, We Live in Public, which if you haven't seen it, it's awesome, as a kind of like older, oh, older, you know, like what, 30 years, um, example of something where, you know, for art's sake, people were forced to live under surveillance. And yeah, it was edgy, but kind of seemed timely and expected and maybe normal. Hat Person provides us some insight into actually being on a reality TV show, which he was, so I'll just leave this, you should just read this because it's interesting and a little scary towards the end. To Mini Marcus, I have absolutely no idea what my IQ is and I forget my SAT score, but it was not good. I remember being very upset. Um, and that's, I mean, I'm terrible at taking tests. And also, like, those numbers don't really tell you how smart anyone is. Like, I know people with very high IQs who are, in certain situations, not the smartest people, and people who did worse on their SAT than if they were to just fill in random boxes, who are some of the smartest people that I know. So, you know. Smartness is a whole, whole lot of stuff. And just as a point of clarification, and maybe pride, Matthew Rumi, who is responding to Mini Marcus, I wish I had a team of writers. That would be awesome. It's just me. And while I totally agree with Shin Gurugamesh, I can't shake the feeling that they're just trying to hurt my feelings. And it is on that note that we transition to trolls. So instead of responding to specific comments, um, I'm just gonna talk for a second and we're just gonna throw some comments down at the bottom that uh, illustrate what I think were the largest and most frequently made comments and responses. One of the most common responses was people saying that I unfairly lumped trolls and harassers together into one group of people. However, I think for a lot of people, their experience of the internet is that trolls to them are only harassers, that they might not even know this other group of people exists or they don't see a distinction between them. They see all of these people as there to harass them. Which is exactly why I became uncomfortable saying that there is a good side to trolling because to a lot of people, trolls just are people who threaten and harass them. Knowing and being able to make a distinction between funny waste your time troll and death threats troll is itself a kind of privilege. Which really makes me wonder what percentage of the group of people saying that there is a clear difference between funny waste your time troll and death threats troll are straight white guys like me. I mean, I did it and then I tried really hard to see it from another perspective and it was scary. And finally, to everybody saying that trolling makes you a better, stronger, or smarter person, I think this is the position that the episode started out in that I revised because it becomes very complicated to say that when you realize that trolling is not the exact same thing for every person who experiences it. And furthermore, to everybody who thinks that someone becomes a stronger or better person because they know how to deal with rape or death threats, I don't know what world you live in, but it's nothing like mine. What? This week's episode was brought to you by the hard work of these very reasonable people. You will notice there is only one writer. We have an IRC, a Facebook, and a subreddit. Links in the description. And the tweet of the week comes from Thomas Hatter, who asks whether or not it's okay that he had an epiphany while playing an RPG. I say, you can have epiphanies while reading novels, maybe while watching YouTube shows. Why not an RPG? Seems fun to me. And of course, we have to switch out a record. I know I said we weren't gonna be doing any more record swaps of things that were already on the wall, but 
In observance of Pete Seeger's recent passing, I would feel much better about keeping him on the wall, so we're gonna give him a place with a little bit more visibility. Again, we'll eventually replace Johnny Cash, but welcome, Pete Seeger, America's balladeer.